Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our second of five talks about centrality. We're looking at the human self, the idea that each of us is a person or a me in the world. And in this second talk of the series, we'll focus on how that sense of me is developed as a kind of story in the brain and the mind. We'll see how we can consider the sorts of stories we're telling ourselves and how those affect us. And we can also see the benefit that comes from just noticing the insubstantial nature of our personal story, how it's helpful, it's somewhat based in reality, but it's also, in the end, a kind of creative product that we can take a little less seriously than we often do. And that can help us live with a greater sense of stability and ease in the world. Let's begin. So here we are as a human being. And of course, we're not floating through space all by ourselves. We're a human being in the context of a great big world. And as mentioned last time, this poses some challenges for us, and we work pretty hard to figure out how to proceed in the most effective way that we are capable of. And a big part of developing a sense of me is finding an effective strategy, an effective path. And what we often do in the development of this sense of me is look at ourselves in isolation. We become rather self-focused, wondering how well we're doing, how other people perceive us, etc. People vary in how self-absorbed they are, but everyone has a little bit of the tendency to be pretty concerned about their identity. We tend to highlight a feeling of separation from the world around us. We feel very much like lone individuals. This is at least very true, I think, in the West, possibly less true in some other countries. But in the U.S., where I currently reside, this is a very common approach, is to be quite individualistic and to think of ourselves as quite separate from the world around us. And a certain aspect of the quality of centrality relates to this feeling of separation that we're not just at the center of a world of experience, we're somehow isolated from that world. That sense of isolation isn't entirely an illusion. Life is separate from the world around it at its most basic level. So the fundamental unit of life is a cell. We see a diagram of one here. And a cell is defined as being a region of space filled with living processes bounded by a membrane that separates it from the environment. The membrane here is shown in yellow. And it does indeed separate the inside from the outside so that the important chemicals, the proteins and so on that are inside the cell can be kept within and dangerous materials like toxins on the outside can be kept out. But the cell membrane is not like a sheet of plastic wrap because it also has to function to facilitate exchange between the inside of the cell and the outside world. So the cell needs to bring in water and nutrients and it needs to release waste products and very often it needs to communicate with other cells by releasing chemicals and so on. So the cell membrane is a separator. It divides the inside from the out, but it is not an impermeable barrier. The technical term here is semi-permeable. It does allow the passage of some substances selectively, but not all. For this series of talks about centrality, I want to focus on what stays within, this idea of being inside something that is separate from the outside. 
if we scale this up to the level of a whole human, we can see that, yeah, in a certain sense, psychologically, we have a very strong tendency to be self-referential, self-reflective. And again, people vary in how much they engage in self-reflection, but all of us do some of it. All of us have the sense of having an inner experience that is somehow our own, and we attend to it quite a bit, if only to determine whether we're feeling good or bad about what's going on. Well, if we went a little further, we would say that that experience is rather diffuse and flowing. And actually, in direct experience, we may not find a solid barrier that marks exactly where what we think of as our inside is separate from our outside. In the realm of thoughts and feelings and bodily sensations, there's a flowing quality that's rather diffuse. And if we close our eyes and look for the edges of it, they're not distinct. And yet we still have the sense of being, in some way, at least partially and importantly, separate from what's around us. And that's natural. But it's worth looking a little deeper at that sense of separation. What is it that seems separate? Well, as I've mentioned, one of the experience we have that seems very much our own that we have direct access to it, but others don't. They have their own versions, but not ours, is the sense of different bodily regions and the different textures of experience that occur there, exemplified by the chakra system. So there are many chakras in the yoga and Hindu tradition, actually more than are pictured here, because there are different regions of the body that have different qualities of experience. There are different hot spots of energetic flow, so to speak. To simplify things for us who aren't advanced practitioners of yoga, or at least I'm certainly not, I'm just going to focus on three regions, what we'll call the head body, because the experience of the body in the head differs from the experience of the body in what I call the heart body, and it differs from what I call the experience down lower in the lower belly and pelvis, which I'll refer to as the earth body. And this is a very basic and simple introduction to a relatively simple approach. That is just three regions rather than many more. This isn't my own system entirely. Uh, in fact, mostly it is due to other people, in particular, a person I consider one of my spiritual teachers, John Prendergast, who likewise uh, divides the body into these three regions. And I am adapting his approach and making it a little more biological. And for today, I don't even want to look at all three of those. Let's just look at the uppermost level, the head. So in the head, we know there's a brain. And as we saw in the last video, there is a lot of electrical activity in there that has this kind of sparkling quality to it. Now, brains have been interesting to people for a very long time, and they've been the subject of versions of scientific study for several centuries. Of course, as time has gone on, we've gotten more and more knowledgeable. We have better and better techniques. There's been a lot of work done. Early on, the ideas were relatively crude, and they can be easily mocked from our perspective now. But quite early in the consideration of what a brain is all about came the idea that maybe different brain regions relate to different functions of human experience. And it was believed for a time that you could actually palpate a person's skull or examine it uh, visually and tell how developed various faculties were in that particular person. That so-called science of phrenology uh, has long since been discredited, but the basic idea that different regions of the brain or head space do different things has persisted in a modified form. So for instance, toward the back of the head, there's an area that does a lot of work around vision. We could call this a region that is responsible in part for seeing. Now, in fact, there are many regions of the brain that are involved in vision. It's not just at the back of the head. But the back of the head clearly is important to sight. In the brain along the sides of the heads, toward the ears, and particularly on the left side for most people, there are regions that relate to communication 
speech and language, conversing. Now, these regions do more than just produce speech and language, and other regions of the brain are involved in speech and language, but there is a sense in which speech is concentrated in these areas. And then up in the front of the brain is the famous prefrontal cortex, which has a lot to do with what we call knowing or understanding or executive functions. And again, you know, understanding involves more than the prefrontal cortex, and the prefrontal cortex does more than just provide conceptual understanding. But there is at least a rough sense in which different regions are responsible for these different functions. And today I want to look at this idea of understanding. You know, how do we do this? Very surprising and rather remarkable ability we have of understanding things in these conceptual and abstract terms. In the simplest sense, we could look at it like this. That our mind, so to speak, moves outside of the body and takes a kind of detached perspective. So if we're trying to understand ourselves, this me, and the body that we carry around with us, we remove ourselves from that body and look back on it conceptually as if from a kind of distance. So we have this impression that we are examining ourselves and our body as if that self and that body were separate items in the environment, objects. So I can think of my brain as an object. I can imagine it. I can know some things. If I've ever had an MR scan, which in fact I have, I can know some things about it. But isn't it interesting that this brain that I know about is actually the brain that is thinking? This taking a detached or separate perspective is what gives us so-called objective understanding. In other words, this is how science is done and, and a lot of other human uh, knowledge is built up this way. Again, this is you know, nothing terribly surprising, nothing revolutionary, but worth examining. And it should be clear that in this process, we have highlighted a feeling of separation from the thing being examined. When I look back upon my body with this objective perspective, I have a feeling of separation from it. Of course, it's worth continuing to remember that somehow that sense of separation is generated by this sparkling electrical activity in this very complex brain tissue. And even the images and ideas I have about the body that's being examined, and even the feelings directly felt within it that I might comment on in a kind of objective way, all of that is likewise somehow very closely associated with brain activity. And so we can meditate in this way. We can see in our mind's eye the body and the brain that the head contains. And then we can feel directly into that head region where we tend to reside when we're thinking. Our consciousness centers there. So we can feel the space of thinking around the head above and behind the eyes. And we can imagine that organ we call a brain that is also in that same region above and behind the eyes. And we can remember that both the image we hold in mind and the sense of a person who's choosing the imagery, they're both related in a very intimate way to this cellular, vibrating, living phenomenon. And that meditation can go quite far. And I encourage you to practice it on your own. But we'll move on.
So this objective understanding looks at the body as an object, even though the brain is within that very body. When it does this, it's in, a sen in essence doing the same thing as the MR scanner that we introduced last time. The body is an object that's viewed as if from the outside. Here we have an actual technician looking at a monitor of what's inside the body. But when I think about my brain inside my own skull, I'm taking exactly that same perspective, at least conceptually. I like to think of this as telling a story about my body. We often believe science is giving us factual information, that it's not as fluid and imaginative as telling a story to children, for instance. But there is a sense in which a story is being told. And no, it's not a children's story. It's a scientific story. And yet it has some of the elements of we know the history of the body. We can make predictions about what's coming. It's a storytelling function. Now, the story that gets built up is fairly reliable. It depends on evidence. It can be uh, talked about with others who probably will agree with the basic framework. But it is nonetheless a narrative of sorts. It's a description of the body in language, which in a certain sense is a story. Of course, most of the time when we're telling the story of our body, we're not talking about something as scientific and biological as a nervous system. We're talking about our individual self, the self that's trying to find its way in the world. And a lot of that sense of finding our way early in life in particular seems to revolve around all sorts of features of our lives that we attach to our sense of identity. Features like my beliefs, my knowledge, my social connections, my successes and failures, my possessions, my preferred activities or things I have to do to earn money, the locations where I visit, my preferences on all sorts of levels, and in particular, my body and my mind, all of these kind of get wrapped together into a very complex sense of me, a very complex story. And that story has a certain sense of feeling isolated from everybody else's story. In other words, it's built into this image of a me in the world. And the me as a word, you know, here in quotation marks, is a very simple word, just two letters. But it's holding a lot. It's a placeholder for all of that information, all of those stories that I tell about myself. So when we go back to the prefrontal cortex and think that it is capable of understanding, and so it's capable of understanding this me, we could reframe that and say that what it's really doing is not simply understanding me, but telling a kind of story about myself. Now, if this doesn't seem very scientific, we can go a step further here. When brains are imaged, they can be imaged in multiple planes. Uh, the three main examples are shown here. There can be a plane that goes vertically through the skull right down the midline, extending from the forehead to the back of the head. It, they can be done vertically through a plane that goes from ear to ear. And they can be sectioned, as it were, in a horizontal plane that goes again from the forehead to the back of the head. So we have these three different views, and they can be mapped simultaneously with images that track brain activity. And so here we're watching this in real time. And what's happening in this scanning is the person is in the scanner and they're told simply to do their ordinary thinking about their lives, thinking about themselves in the usual way that all of us do when we're not occupied on some other task. And the picture that's built up with that scan shows that certain regions of the brain become more active when a person is telling the story of themselves. The story of the self has a lot to do with activity in that area of knowing up in the prefrontal cortex, but it involves other areas also. It's technically referred to as the default mode network, this collection of brain regions that activate during self-storytelling. It's not entirely 
without uh, detractors, this notion of the default mode network, but it's generally accepted. And it's certainly a useful idea because certainly when we think about ourselves, we will be activating in a kind of habitual way certain regions of our brain tissue. And somehow or another, this becomes in our direct experience, when we take that more inside perspective, this becomes the story of myself, the story of me. Now for many people, and, and frankly I'm in this category, the story is a rather tragic one. You know, there's trauma and loss and betrayal and mistakes and harm that has been done and regret and remorse and shame. You know, and of course, there's other stuff too. There's pride and success and joy and love. But for many people, the story that we tell of ourselves focuses on the problems, because after all, we're trying to solve various problems by telling these stories. That's the biological purpose of it. And so it can get the flavor of a sort of ongoing tragedy, or at least an ongoing conflict. Now, there are certainly people that don't tell quite such a sad and tragic story. They remember happy childhoods, and they focus on the positive, and they have uh, a lot of joy in their lives. So I'm not saying everybody has a negative leaning self story, but many people do. And the natural tendency for the self is to get rather rigid and uh, to not provide the most fluid and vibrant sense of being, because after all, it is a kind of rehearsed story that we play over and over. If we're depressed and we tend to be looking at things very pessimistically and negatively, it can certainly be helpful to focus more on positive aspects, to remember the things in our lives that we're actually grateful for, to feel joy for the people that we care about, etc. So it is important, I think, to monitor the kind of story we're telling ourselves and to make sure that it's not unrelenting in its flavor of negativity. But as we examine the story and kind of edit it to make it a little more positive, if necessary, we can also take the step of remembering that no matter what story we tell ourselves, somehow or another, it's ultimately related to this vibrant activity of electrical chemical signals within billions of brain cells. What's more, even the telling of that story, the person that seems to be thinking, is likewise somehow related to that same kind of cellular activity. And so we have this feeling of being a person, a self that is telling a story about itself. And so there's the story I have in my mind about who I am and where I came from and what I'm all about. And then there's also this sense of being a person that is able to tell that story the storyteller and the story. Well, one step I can take to soften the tendency I might have of taking the story very seriously and taking myself very seriously is to remember that the storyteller is indeed just this diffuse vibrating pattern of neural activity in an unimaginably complex weave of brain tissue, like we saw last time. And so when I think about myself, I can think about it in these sorts of terms of consisting of this activity. Now, initially, that thinking of myself in this way will be rather heady. It will feel like I'm up in my head thinking about the brain activity and the cellular activity in my body. But I can relax that sense of headiness and expand my awareness so that there's a more diffuse quality to it that spreads beyond the head and softens and feels more fluid and alive. And so this is when we begin to really see the value of moving into the space of centrality and allowing our awareness to spread and vibrate, not just in the head, but throughout the whole human form. But early on, some of it is certainly conceptual, some of it is up in the head. And so the first step is just to notice that we can kind of move back and forth between the head space and the body space. And so we can make a meditation out of this understanding, this knowing. We've told a story here based in biology of a brain with 
very complex structure and electrical activity that develops the capacity of objective understanding and storytelling, the sense of being a person. And we can feel that sense of being here, being a person right here. At the same time, we have many ideas about the kind of person we are, what we've been through, what we've achieved, where we've fallen short. We can imagine how our body looks as if we were in front of a mirror. We can build up a sense of this me conceptually. And we can also just let the whole thing, all the stories and images, blend with the sense of being a person, a consciousness, having sensations, feelings. The whole field of aliveness can include both our sense of thinking and what we're thinking about. Our sense of choosing a focus for our awareness and the thing we focus on. All of it happening in the same biological organism. this complex biology that we can both understand in a way and feel very intimately. So that alternation between knowing what we understand and feeling what we feel and being an observer and also having something in the field of observation. We can move through those different perspectives. So they all flow together. Biologically, they also flow together. Very powerful meditation.